Well, good morning, and it's Sunday, and you have joined us, and that is a great blessing for us, and we hope we're going to be a great blessing to you as we continue a series we've entitled The Hard Sayings of Jesus, because sometimes Jesus said things that were kind of hard to understand, and at first glance were outright outrageous and sometimes offensive to many people, and so I'm so glad to have you here, certainly online as well as in person. My first call into the ministry out of the seminary was to Our Savior Lutheran Church, Brookings, South Dakota, which I thought was strange for a kid who grew up in L.A. One of the the things you don't realize, but you learn quickly when you come out of the seminary, is how important your ordination day into the ministry is and your installation into your first church is. When I was installed and ordained as a pastor in Brookings, South Dakota, it was a special Sunday afternoon, and about two-thirds of all of the Wells pastors in South Dakota drove and attended that service. It was surprising to me. But what was even more shocking is that um, a great number of them, I didn't know this was the custom, decided to come over to our house after the service to hang out for refreshment and some discussions. And some of them stayed until the wee hours of the next day. I was getting to the point, you know, uh, don't you guys got to have a home? Don't you need to leave? You need to go. My in-laws were there. They went to bed. You know, my parents left. I'm like, these people are still in our garage. They're not leaving But I was reminded of how important it was. And I knew that, I kind of knew that some of them may come over after that afternoon service, and so I made sure I had some libations from the local liquor store. But since I wasn't preaching that morning, I waited until Sunday morning to go to the liquor store and, and buy the beer. And it's then that I discovered at that point, and I think it's still true today, in South Dakota, on Sundays, they don't sell real beer. They sell 3 2 beer which is really low octane, right, 3.2% alcohol. And of course, they made a lot of fun for me in that. And I thought to myself, what in the world is that? Well, that was one of those blue laws that were often given on Sundays where they either canceled or strongly curtailed certain activities on Sunday that you could do the rest of the week, but just on Sunday, so they would encourage greater church attendance. In the past... And even up to this day, there are cities and there are states in our country where there are certain activities you simply can't do on Sunday. Like go to a liquor store, buy a new car, or some other kind of shopping. They're called blue laws. So tell me, is that the principle God had in mind behind what we call the third commandment? by adhering to those blue laws. Does that somehow make us closer to God? Uh, Would Jesus shop for a car on Sunday? Last week, we began our series entitled The Hard Sayings of Jesus, and we started out by talking about the fact that Jesus demands that if you follow him, he needs to be the number one priority, the most important relationship in your life. And he made that bold statement glaringly apparent by using some pretty tough language. He used the word hate. He says, unless you hate your mother or father or your son or daughter, you can't really follow me. When Jesus was telling us that he needs to be that number one relationship in our lives, he was again proclaiming himself to be God in the flesh, the Son of God, the Savior, the King of kings, and the Lord of lords. When Jesus made such declarations in his ministry, Those around him would often claim that he was blaspheming, which was calling yourself God, especially the religious leaders would say that. He was blaspheming. But for Jesus, it really wasn't a sin at all. He was proclaiming that very same thing, that he was the Son of God. Now in this text, Jesus makes a claim so outrageous that the religious leaders don't even have a name for this one. Jesus now tells them he's come to this earth not to reform religion, but to replace it with himself. And it's all about the Sabbath. Take a look at Mark chapter 2, verse 23. One Sabbath day, 
Jesus was going through the grain fields, and as his disciples walked along, they began to pick some heads of grain. The Pharisees said to him, look, why are they doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? The Pharisees believed it was bad enough that Jesus was not following their man-made Sabbath laws about fasting. But now they accuse Jesus and his disciples of even breaking one of the Ten Commandments, the one that has to do with the Sabbath. You see, in the Old Testament, among God's people, the Jews or the Hebrews, um, they had certain laws that we categorize as civil laws and ceremonial laws. And they were there to make sure they kept the nation of Israel a distinct group of people through whom the Savior was going to come, physically and humanly speaking. That was the purpose of those laws. Those laws were to keep everything in place. And that was those weird laws sometimes you read about when you're reading your Old Testament, like the food laws. Like in Israel, in the Old Testament, you could not eat shellfish. No shrimp cocktail for you. Uh, You couldn't have bacon because you couldn't eat pork. You uh, also understood that if you grew a beard, you, you couldn't trim it or you couldn't braid it. You had to wear certain clothing, you had worshipped on certain days, and your government wasn't really run by people, it was a theocracy, God ran it. All of those were to keep Israel together, those civil and ceremonial laws, until the Savior came, until Jesus came. In the New Testament, it tells us when Jesus came, those laws were no longer needed. This is why Colossians 2 says this, Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, the the fulfillment, is found in Christ. All those civil and ceremonial laws were really to be a big arrow pointing to the Savior to come. Once Jesus arrives on the scene, those laws are no longer needed. He's now here in the flesh. And he has fulfilled them. Those laws are no longer binding on New Testament Christians like you and me. But the Pharisees didn't believe that Jesus was the fulfillment, the Messiah. And so they didn't believe he was the fulfillment of the law. And they were just upset with Jesus because he had broken one of their unscriptural man-made laws about the Sabbath. They completely ignored the fact that by making their extra laws and adding them to God's law, they were breaking God's law. Jesus in no way was violating the Sabbath as he's eating the heads of the grain with his disciples because in Deuteronomy it actually said this. If you enter your neighbor's grain field, you may pick kernels with your hands, but you must not put a sickle to their standing grain. You couldn't harvest on the Sabbath. According to the Pharisees at this point, they believed that their rule against picking grain was the equivalent to God's rules that he had given about the Sabbath. And they believed that their man-made rules were over and above God's rules. And you need to understand that in order to understand this text. The Pharisees were all about what a lot of people do today. It's all about man-made religion and their own truth. You see, the Pharisees came up with 613 different laws or regulations or rules, or laws really, um, that were meant to be kind of a hedge or build a fence around God's word so no one would break it. But in doing that, they didn't realize they were breaking the very law of God they were trying to protect. Because in Deuteronomy, once again, it says, do not add to what I command you, and do not subtract from it, but keep the commands of the Lord your God that I give you. In adding the weight of their own traditions to God's word, Jesus in Matthew 23 tells us they were, they tied up heavy and cumbersome loads and put them on other people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. Interesting, if you read about the Pharisees and even Judaism today, Orthodox Judaism, the Jews have 39 Sabbath rules, the the Pharisees did, that ranged across your life. For example, on the the Sabbath, you could... uh, you could not look in a mirror, ladies, gentlemen. Couldn't look in a mirror. Because you might be tempted to fix your hair. As well as uh, put up makeup, which was some violation of their tanning. I don't know how that works, but that's true. 
Uh, on the Sabbath day, you weren't allowed to light a candle during the Sabbath. So if you're going to light any candles, you've got to light them before the Sabbath, and you can't put them out during the Sabbath because that's work. You have to wait till the after the Sabbath. In modern day, it's light switches. You've got to turn all the lights on before the Sabbath begins and only turn them off after the Sabbath ends. If your chicken laid an egg on the Sabbath, you couldn't eat it because that would be harvesting. You had to wait for the next day. But I do believe you could sell it to your neighbor. I don't know how that all works. They had all of those laws and believed they were really important. And now they're thinking that their whole law against fasting, make sure you fast, you couldn't even eat the heads of grain on the Sabbath, they believed that was equal to God's law, the Old Testament, saying, hey, you know, on the Sabbath, don't do any harvesting. Don't do any winnowing, okay? Don't do any of that. But to make matters worse, the Pharisees again believed that their laws were equal to or above God's word. And they had developed a legalistic religious system that said salvation is gained by following those laws and regulations. Not only that, for the average Jew in Jesus' day, their whole life was really cumbersome. They were always trying to figure out how they could stay ceremonially clean and the Pharisees kept teaching them a man-made religion that says, you gain heaven through your good works, through following our laws and God's laws too, and by your nice intentions. It was just pure legalism, pure work righteousness. And Jesus now calls their error front and center in church. He answered, have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need? In the days of Abiathar, the high priest, he entered the house of God and ate the consecrated bread, which is lawful only for the priest to eat. He also gave some to his companions. Having used the example of David and Abiathar in 1 Samuel chapter 21, which they would have known, Jesus, in essence, says to these religious leaders, hey, you guys apparently don't read the Bible, do you? You don't read it because you would then have known the principle that was laid down when God gave us the third commandment all about the Sabbath. Human need is always a higher consideration for God than somehow man-made religious rituals. And then Jesus drops this bomb on them. Verse 27. Then he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man, which is a messianic term, the Son of Man is Lord, even of the Sabbath. The word Sabbath means deep rest or deep peace. It's kind of a close synonym to shalom. Have you heard that word shalom? Which is an all-encompassing and uh, uh, all-flourishing in your life. When, uh, When Jesus says, I am the Lord of the Sabbath, Jesus means he is the Sabbath. He's the source of that Sabbath rest. He has come to earth to make sure you now completely do and know a different kind of rest. That his his, uh, command for a a regular time of rest during the week was just a foretaste of the deep rest he could give that you can only find in Jesus. That's the great blessing. And just to make sure, everyone there knew that Jesus was that Sabbath rest. It was really all about the rest he, the Savior, can alone bring. Jesus does this on another Sabbath day in front of his enemies. Chapter 3, verse 1. Another time Jesus went into the synagogue, and a man with a shriveled hand was there. That's a birth defect. It means literally withered, uh, withered or shrunken. It's a small hand, much smaller than a normal hand. So everyone would have seen that. It was easy to see that. Some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus. So they watched him closely to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath. Jesus said to the man with the shriveled hand, stand up in front of everyone. He's going to make sure everyone sees him. No tricks here, right? Because they would accuse him of tricking him. Then Jesus asked them, which is lawful on the Sabbath? To do good or to do evil? To save life or to kill? But they remained silent. Jesus looked around at them in anger and, deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts, said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was completely restored. Now, brand new hand. You can't fake that. Brand new hand. Then the Pharisees, they didn't deny it, but then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might 
kill Jesus. The man's completely healed, brand new hand, in an instant. Now here's what's interesting, it's sometimes lost on us. Jesus healed this man, but he never spoke a word of healing, like be healed, nor, nor did Jesus touch the man to heal him. So technically, Jesus did not violate the Pharisees' unscriptural man-made laws on the Sabbath either, which probably really irked them. And the miracle was undeniable. When Jesus calls you and I to rest on a regular basis every week, to rest physically and, and mentally, that's a good thing. He calls us to that kind of rest. But he also calls us to take a, a, a deeper rest, a deeper level of rest. In Genesis chapter 1, you have the account of God creating the world in seven days. And at the end of that account, it says, on the seventh day, God rested. What does that mean? Did God get tired? No, God doesn't get tired. Another reason you can rest from your work is that it's all done. You're satisfied. You're absolutely satisfied with it. It's finished. And so you can stop doing it, walk away from it. It's done. In Genesis 1, we're told that at the end of the creation week, God said, oh, it is very good. It was all finished. And so he rested. He stopped creating. It's important to note. Most of us, as sinful human beings at times in our lives, we all get on that hamster wheel, wheel, looking for real satisfaction and real, uh, I say real rest and peace. Because we all have a tendency to try to work and work to make ourselves look good in front of ourselves, in front of God, in front of people, to tell, tell them we're worthy, we're worth something, you know, we're important. And if you continue on that hamster wheel all of your life, you will wear yourself down physically, emotionally, spiritually. And some of you know what I'm talking about because you're worn out. And you'll continue to be like that until you find the true deep rest and peace that is alone in Jesus. At the end of his great creation week, God looked at his creation and said, it is finished. And he rested. On the cross, at the end of his great act of redemption, Jesus said, it is finished. And now we can rest. You see, the rest that we really need is down here in our life. It's the deep rest. We still get off and often get you know, all absorbed in this rest up here. We're trying to get by impressing other people and trying to get that satisfaction. When the true satisfaction, the true rest, the true need, Jesus has given us below. See, Jesus has lived the life we couldn't live, but God demanded so he lived it for us. Jesus died the death that we should have died. And it's only when you rest secure in Jesus' finished work do you realize that you don't have to be in that hamster wheel for importance and significance and purpose. That you can rest in Jesus' finished work. You realize that God the Father is satisfied with you. And that means no matter what you face in life here, you can have a deep peace, even when sometimes things aren't so peaceful. You see, physicians will tell you that you don't need just to, just to take a nap now and then. You need deep rest. You can go ahead and go on all the vacations you want and go up north to your cabin all the times you want, but you're never gonna find the deep rest that you need for your soul, for your mind, for your emotions. It's only found in the gospel. It's only found in what Jesus has done for you. That's it. But if you don't look for it there, you're gonna keep running on the hamster wheel. On the cross, Jesus experienced restlessness as he was separated from God himself, being punished for our sins. So that through Jesus, we can rest secure, knowing that God loves us and that we are forgiven in Jesus. That's why the most important event that you put on your calendar or that repeats on your weekly calendar is this. It's this, it's worship. It's not your children's athletic games. Soccer, t-ball, baseball, volleyball. It's not your golf times with your buddies. It's not you going up north to the cabin. 
Those things are nice. Those are great blessings. But they're not more important than what's happening right here as we gather around God's word. Because only God's word, only Jesus gives you the real rest, the real peace that you need that impacts every other area of your life. And if you get that, because some of you don't, but if you get that, then you understand the difference between man-made religion and a relationship with Jesus. So it's Sunday, Sunday. Now after worship, go ahead and go shop for a new car, if you can find one. So it's Sunday. Now after worship, go ahead and harvest some of the crops you have in your garden in the backyard. Pick those cucumbers that multiply like rabbits. Go ahead, you can do that. No problem with that on this day. It's Sunday, so after worship, go ahead and buy yourself one, maybe three, butter burgers from Culver's. After all, Chick-fil-A's closed. It's Sunday. After worship, you can go ahead and sit in the Lombardi Cathedral. And there on Sunday, you can drink real beer that costs you about the equivalent of two gallons of gas. <laughs> you can do all those things with a clear Christian conscience. Because Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath, we can rest from religion forever. 